In this class, we continue our way through the nervous system. If you recall, we started off with our microscopic physiological discussion, looking at the neuron and the action potential. Then we looked at more of the gross anatomy, studying some of the nerves. We moved into the spinal cord and, and talked about some reflexes. Now we're going to be ascending our central nervous system. We'll talk about the brain stem and the brain. And what we're going to be identifying as we go through this are various regions of the brain with their particular functions, brain centers, if you will. So for some of you that have been waiting for an opportunity to get out some flashcards, this is your moment. As we look at the different areas, you'll be responsible for knowing where in the brain and brain stem they are, as well as the function. So by the time we're all said and done, you should have a list of brain and brainstem parts, if you will, and function. Some of the areas are going to have a distinct function. Other areas are simply going to be a relay station for information to go from one part of the body to another. What we're also hoping you get out of this is some idea of integration and function with respect to the nervous system. Remember, we had said way back when we talked about homeostasis that we are receptor-driven organisms. We put a lot of importance on sensory information coming in in order to coordinate and regulate motor function going out. So in this case, we'll be emphasizing sensory versus motor function with respect to how we control voluntary movements. So we'll start at the brainstem and we'll move superiorly from there. Uh, grossly speaking, we have three main areas of the brainstem. The medulla oblongata being the most inferior. That's going to be the first part of the brainstem we get to. So as we're ascending the spinal cord, we meet our medulla oblongata. We continue to ascend. We go through the pons. And then finally, we go through the midbrain. Now, as we're talking about certain parts uh, of the brain and brain stem, we can help but identify some other parts, even if we haven't gotten to them yet. But here we have our brain stem as a whole. Spinal cord, just inferior to it. We'll talk about our cerebellum that exists just posterior to it. And we've also mentioned the production of cerebral spinal fluid a little earlier. And we mentioned that that's produced deep in the brain and it exits those ventricles through various apertures and openings. Here is going to be the fourth ventricle and continuing down leading into the central canal that runs down the spinal cord. Our medulla being the most inferior portion of our brain stem. Our pons just superior to it and just superior again lies our midbrain. As we said, we're picking out various areas that are going to be important to us either this semester or next. And as we look at them, we're going to be refining them in certain cases. So when we get to the brainstem, you see a lot of areas for vital function, respiratory regulation and cardiovascular regulation in particular. So in the medulla, we see rhythmicity areas. Now, once you get to AMP2, you'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. They're actually divided up. You have a ventral group and a dorsal group, with the dorsal group controlling the transition between resting inhalation and exhalation, while the ventral group takes over in times of more active breathing, such as during exercise. But for now, lump them together the respiratory area as part of our medulla oblongata. We also see a cardiovascular center. You'll talk about the cardiovascular center in more detail when it comes to heart rate regulation. And again, divide it up. We actually have a cardiovascular inhibitory center and a cardiovascular acceleratory center, slowing down and speeding the heart rate up respectively. Where we're going to spend more time and make it more relevant this semester is going to be with the inferior olivary nucleus. I said some of these are going to be simply relay stations. The inferior olivary nucleus is one of them.
the inferior olivary nucleus is going to be a relay center for unconscious proprioceptive information. Proprioception is your body's three-dimensional awareness of where it is in space. So you close your eyes as you listen to this lecture, and you don't need your eyes to tell you what position your arms, legs, and head are in. You're constantly getting information about the stretches of every single muscle in the body. Tensions put on every single tendon. Stretch and compression on all of the integument system. That information collectively will come through the inferior olivary nucleus and get relayed. It'll synapse in the inferior olivary nucleus and get relayed over to the cerebellum. You'll see in a little bit, the cerebellum is going to be talked about as a center for balance and coordination. In order for us to balance and coordinate, we kind of have to know what position the body currently resides in. And it's the ION that relays that information into the cerebellum. What we also see in the, in the medulla is the crossing over of motor fibers. We call it the decostation of pyramids. I'm sure you've heard at some point that the right-hand side of the brain controls the left-hand side of the body and vice versa. Well, we start off with volitional, voluntary actions in one hemisphere of the brain. Those fibers descend to the brainstem on their way ultimately to the muscle structures. They cross over to the opposite side of the cord through the medulla. 90% of all motor fibers cross over in the medulla. The 10% that don't cross over in the medulla will stay ipsilateral down the spinal cord. Then they will cross over at the level at which they exit the cord. We move on up and we get to the pons. Here we get two other respiratory groups. This time we have our apneustic area. It's stimulatory for the actions of inhalation, so it will cause a diaphragm to contract and pull down. Now, the pneumotaxic does not stimulate exhalation. You'll see when you do respiratory that resting exhalation is a passive process. So we get a stimulatory effect for inhalation, then we get an inhibitory effect for inhalation. So the apneustic causes you to breathe in, the pneumotaxic simply causes you to stop breathing in. But more relevant to us this semester is going to be the pontine nucleus, another relay center. This time, we're getting voluntary motor actions that start in the cerebrum. The cerebrum, we'll talk about shortly, is your higher brain, your conscious brain. A signal to voluntarily contract the muscle will originate in the cerebrum, go through the pontine nucleus, and again wind up in the cerebellum. Now, remember, we've got information going through the inferior olivary nucleus to the cerebellum. And we got information coming through the pontine nucleus to the cerebellum. And in this way, the cerebellum now has both pieces of vital information necessary to control balance. It has where the body is currently. And it has voluntary actions that are originating in the higher brain centers, but haven't even reached the muscle yet. So it knows where you are, and it knows where you're going. That is two vital pieces of information that the cerebellum is going to need if it's going to be the center of balance and coordination. And of course, as mentioned earlier, our cerebellum resides just off the posterior. So we have our proprioceptive information coming up the cord, synapsing in the inferior olivary nucleus and making its way to the cerebellum. We've got voluntary motor function coming from the higher brain centers, synapsing in our pontine nucleus, and again getting relayed to the cerebellum. In the midbrain, we've got four areas to be considered. We've got two pairs of colliculi, 
we have superior colliculi involved with visual reflexes and inferior colliculi involving auditory reflexes. Both are going to be reflexes that are protective for the face and head. For our visual reflex, it's going to work off of your peripheral vision. You catch something moving out of your peripheral vision if it's perceived to be coming towards you. That visual input relays through our superior colliculi, innervates the muscles of the neck, much in the same way we had our stretch reflexes uh, in our last chapters. It's going to cause the neck muscles to turn the head and face away from the moving object in an attempt to protect the face and eyes. The auditory reflex is a response to a loud, startling sound, in which case that auditory stimulus reflexes through our inferior colliculi, through the muscles of the neck. This time, it will cause the head to turn towards the sound, almost like a prairie dogging, they call it. If it's going to be protective, you want to be able to see what made the loud noise. So you turn your head in the direction of the loud noise to pick up on more information on where that sound's coming from. The red nucleus is a relay station. Higher brain areas are cerebrum, as mentioned earlier. Voluntary actions originate here. But before they ever make it to the muscle, they relay through the red nucleus where they eventually get to the muscle to innervate the muscle and result in muscle contraction. Now, the cerebellum does have some control over the red nucleus. And this is where we start to get some integration of sensory versus motor activities. Let's go ahead and go to a whiteboard. Now, bear with me while I draw some of this. It's a little tedious to, to draw on the whiteboard. Here's our cerebrum, higher brain centers where motor function is going to originate. Here's our cerebellum in charge of balance and coordination. Here's our inferior olivary nucleus, proprioceptive information that's ascending the cord gets relayed to the cerebellum. Our pontine nucleus, we get motor function originating in the cerebrum, getting relayed to the cerebellum, and our red nucleus, a relay station for the cerebrum to connect to ultimately the muscle. So proprioceptive information ascends the cord, synapses in the inferior olivary nucleus, and then gets relayed to the cerebellum. Voluntary motor activity starts in the cerebrum, goes to the pontine nucleus, then gets relayed to the cerebellum. That same signal leaving the cerebrum also goes to the red nucleus. And we said the red nucleus was a relay station, ultimately going to go down the cord to the muscle. Where our cerebellum comes into coordinating this is that it sends a signal to the red nucleus that happens to be inhibitory. So, as a result, you've got two things occurring at the same time. You've got the cerebellum gathering information about where the body is currently and where the body is about to go. And it's going to exert influence over the red nucleus. 
nothing gets through the red nucleus and ultimately to the muscle without the cerebellum's say so. Now, I want you to picture this like that homeostatic feedback loop. This is not homeostasis, but for homeostasis, we had that receptor control center effector, and we said that that cycle was continuously moving. The receptors are always monitoring current states and always recruiting effector organs as need to maintain a narrow range. Here, likewise, we've got this constant monitoring, correcting, monitoring, correcting, monitoring, correcting. And it's important to understand what a voluntary movement is. If we have you stretch your arm out and then flex at the elbow, like you're contracting your bicep, to a layperson, that is going to be described as a single movement. From a coordination standpoint, however, I want you to picture it as essentially an infinite number of really tiny movements strung together in time. Because as you have your arm straight, the cerebellum knows that that's the position the arm's in based on the information coming through the inferior olivary nucleus. It gets the origination signal to flex and contract the bicep, and it allows that movement to begin. But as soon as that elbow flexes a fraction of a degree, now all of a sudden the arm's in a different position, and that's getting relayed to the cerebellum again. And that's a whole new position that the cerebellum has to take into account when the cerebrum is continuing to tell the bicep to contract. So we've got this continuous loop of correcting and regulating so that as you bend your arm, it's going to be done so in a very smooth, controlled manner. People that develop tremors, someone who has what we call an intention tremor, where they put something on a fork and as they bring it up to their mouth, the closer they get to their mouth, the more that that fork will start oscillating up and down. Picture that as this entire system, but with a lag. You start the fork moving towards the mouth, it slow, slightly drifts off course. By the time the receptors detect that deviation and relay it to the cerebellum, you've already drifted quite a bit off course. Now you have to correct and bring the fork back up. But as you're doing so, you overshoot. So you're constantly going through this, you know, what normally would be a correction to maintain that smooth movement. Now you've got a correction and an overcorrection and an overcorrection and an overcorrection, giving us your oscillating tremor. So as you go through the simplest of movements, the body always has to take into account the changing positions you go through along the way and take put those into account now as the voluntary motor function continues. And that actually brings us to the last part of the midbrain that we're going to be concerned about, the substantia nigra. Now, we won't have a whole lot of time to go into the substantia nigra. But we include it because it's one that you may have already heard about. Especially now that we bring up the term tremors. The substantia nigra is where we get a neurotransmitter called dopamine produced. And the very common neurological disorder, Parkinson's disease, is a deficiency of dopamine caused by a degeneration of the substantia nigra. Now, if we think about the substantia nigra, it's going to be a regulator of voluntary movement. It doesn't initiate voluntary movement, but it helps smooth voluntary movement out. Think about it as an overlying motor system on top of your voluntary action. So you, you flex that bicep again, like we talked earlier, and bend the arm and straighten and bend the arm and straighten. The substantia nigra takes that general movement, 
and helps smooth it in a controlled manner. And if we think about somebody with the symptoms of Parkinson's, that resting tremor, the shuffling gait, because they no longer have the coordination to do a confident stride, the increased muscle tone as the muscles just become more tense overall, it's all a reflection of the loss of coordination. Now, we already mentioned the cerebellum, and unfortunately, that's the downside to going through our, our brain and brain stem is that we kind of have to introduce certain parts before we even define them. But as mentioned, the cerebellum has to be known as the area for balance and coordination. And now that we've kind of defined what coordination is, isn't balance just coordinated movement? You stand on one foot and you constantly have to sense which way the body is tipping and then make the corrections necessary. So if you're keeping a list of brain parts now, you got your medulla and inside the medulla, you had your cardiovascular centers, you had your respiratory centers, and you had your inferior ovary nucleus. You should know the function of each. Then we moved up to the pons, and we had your pontine nucleus. We had our apneustic area, our pneumotaxic area. We moved up to the midbrain. You had both of your colliculi, you had your substantia nigra, and you had your red nucleus. Now we're in the cerebrum. This is the higher brain level. This is your conscious brain. Memory, sensory perception. We talked about unconscious proprioceptive information earlier. That starts in the receptors of the body and then goes to the, cere the cerebellum. You're unaware of that consciously. Any sensations that you're aware of has to make its way up to the cerebrum. Voluntary motor function comes from there, personality, visual interpretation, hearing interpretation. And of course, mass-wise, it is by far the largest part of the anatomy that we'll get to in this particular section. Now, just like we did for the other anatomy, we're going to break it down, subdivide it up, and label some important parts. So first off, you know, the structures that you would have learned in lab, we've got your longitudinal fissure separating the brain into two hemispheres. You have a central sulcus running, I guess, more or less perpendicular to our longitudinal fissure. And we divide the brain up into lobes. At the anterior, fittingly named, we have our frontal lobes. When you hear frontal lobe, I want you to think motor function. This is also where we're going to get a lot of personality, a lot of memory, a lot of emotional centers, but it's going to be first and foremost known as the area of voluntary motor action. In fact, we can label a couple different parts on our frontal lobe and point out their importance for motor function. We had our central sulcus making its way right across here, right? Just anterior to it, we get a band of tissue called the precentral gyrus. That's where most of your voluntary motor activity comes from. And that part of the brain can even be mapped out into what we call a homunculus, where we can see different parts of the brain controlling voluntary motor actions for particular parts of the body. Now, interestingly, look at what parts of the body are controlled by the largest parts of the brain. You've got the tongue in the voice box. You've got the facial structures. And you've got the hand. Now, mass-wise, as, as a total, that's a pretty small part of the body. Yet it's, what, at least two-thirds of the entire precentral gyrus. Most of the precentral gyrus is going to be dedicated 
to the muscles that have the finest dexterity, the finest fine control. Now, not all motor initiation comes from that part of the brain directly. If we move anterior, you're going to get to a part of the brain called the prefrontal cortex. Now, here we'll see initiation of motor activity for certain actions that you have done basically so often that they've just become somewhat automatic. Picture the voluntary motor actions when you're signing your name, when you're typing, when you're walking across a floor. When you're walking, you're not consciously thinking left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. You just kind of do it, right? Those actions no longer 100% come from our precentral gyrus anymore. And through learn behavior, so to speak, they get shifted out to this portion of the brain. And it bypasses some of the conscious processing and just allows it to happen. Development to this part of the brain happens more effectively at a very early age. And you see this in a very practical sense when we talk about the ability to play a musical instrument. If you take someone who learned how to play the piano, for example, at an older age, they are going to be playing mostly with their precentral cortex. Forget about hearing the notes, and, you know, an ear for music. I'm talking about the mechanics of actually playing. Whereas if you picture somebody who's playing the piano and they played it for so long, it's just effortless to watch. They can play and they can sing and they're just, I mean, from a lay person's perspective, they're just doing it. Watching somebody, however, that's learned at a, at a more advanced age, it looks more laborious. And if you ask them to do something like sing at the same time, it can be a little overwhelming because they're having to put so much thought into actually playing. The last portion of the frontal lobe that I want to point out is a specialized motor center for the muscles of the voice box. It's Broca's area. Broca's area controls, is voluntary, for the, the muscles that, that work the voice box. Really no different than the pre-central gyrus coordinating the bicep, just specialized for the muscles of speech. Now, this doesn't take into account what we call primitive sounds, moans, groans, grunts, squeals. But if you want to coordinate the voice box and the structures to make the sounds of a language and speech, that's going to be originating in Broca's area. So someone that's had a stroke and it's affected Broca's area may very well be able to consciously think of what they want to say. They just can't make the structures function to form the needed sounds. Just posterior to our frontal lobe, we get our left and our right parietal lobe, just posterior to our central sulcus. Now, if the frontal lobe was known for motor function, the parietal lobe is going to be known for sensory function. Any sensations you are consciously aware of are perceived because those impulses have reached the parietal lobe. Deep touch, light touch, pain, vibration is all perceived in the parietal lobe. Now, just like we had a precentral gyrus for so much of our voluntary motor actions, we also have a postcentral gyrus for so much of our perceived sensation. And just like our precentral gyrus, we can also map out our postcentral.
And also, just like our pre-central gyrus, we see a lot of brain dedicated to a very small part of the body. Likewise, tongue and voice box, lips, mouth, and face, and hand. Basically, what this tells us is it confirms what we said earlier about the importance of sensory information coming in in order to give us smooth motor output. Remember the integration that we had drawn on the whiteboard earlier. If we wanted the upper brain to coordinate the bicep in a very controlled manner, we need adequate sensory feedback coming from that bicep. If we want to control the lips and the face, very fine detail, we're going to need sufficient sensation coming back from those same structures. Now we continue on with some of our other lobes and the parts here that we're concerned about get a little bit more straightforward. Most posteriorly we have our occipital lobe. When you think about the occipital lobe think vision. Now of course the other lobes we had picked out specific areas of those lobes that were of importance. For the occipital lobe, it gets real simple. The occipital lobe as a whole is for vision, but mostly the primary visual cortex. Temporal lobe does for hearing what the occipital lobe did for vision. So we think about the lobe as a whole for hearing, but we also have a primary auditory cortex as a more specialized region of the temporal lobe. Now if you'll notice we have a number of association areas. Very often one sensory input is not really going to be sufficient enough. We need this brain integrating and communicating back and forth we need to have these sensations integrated with things like emotion. We need our sensory integrated with our motor. We need hearing and sensory and visual integrated with our memory areas. So that now when you see a picture of a bar stool, you can think, that's a chair, even though you can also look at a lazy boy recliner and also know that that's a chair. It allows you to integrate past experiences with what you're seeing now to formulate these paradigms that you develop throughout life. The last area we have to point out here is going to be Wernicke's area. And think of Wernicke's area as a partner center for our Broca's area. Broca's was a motor center for speech. Wernicke's is an understanding and interpretation area for speech. So that when you hear a word, it was Wernicke's area that helps give it meaning. So a stroke that affects Wernicke's area, you'd still be able to make all the sounds but they would start to lose meaning. We also want to point out the blood-brain barrier. We had mentioned astrocytes when we looked at the different cells. The blood-brain blood barrier is going to be a thin epithelial barrier. with associated astrocytes. It's going to separate general circulating blood from cerebral circulating blood. It's a protective mechanism with a very selectively permeable membrane that's going to act as gatekeepers to allow only certain things to enter cerebral circulation. It's a means of protecting the brain against things like certain toxins, certain infective agents, 
But unfortunately, should something make its way into the cerebral circulation that we don't want there, now it also becomes a barrier to certain medications getting in there. We had mentioned the meninges before. The same arrangement of meninges surround the brain as we had surround the spinal cord. We had talked about cerebrospinal fluid getting produced deep in the ventricles of the brain, making its way ultimately out into our subarachnoid space. We said our subdural space contained blood. It's at the brain where we see these arachnoid villi. They're like one-way doors. They allow cerebral spinal fluid to leave the subarachnoid space, enter the subdural space. Now it's in circulation, and now that cerebral spinal fluid and its contents can be treated like any other blood component. If it's a waste product, it can get rid of it. If it's recycled, it'll be recycled. And lastly, we get to the cranial nerves. You are going to be responsible for the main functions of each cranial nerve. Now, in lab, you're going to have to identify location. And just as an aid for lab, realize these are numbered. They will always go in a particular order depending on where we happen to be talking about them. Generally speaking, they are numbered from anterior to posterior, realizing that this particular diagram is coming out of the board to you, right? You have this brain stem and spinal cord projecting towards you now. So as we enter that region, it's going from superior to inferior. But we will also see groups of cranial nerves come out of single sulcuses, sulci. If we get a bunch of cranial nerves coming out of the same sulci, like we see with cranial nerve 4, 5, 3, right, 3, 4, 5, they are coming out of that sulci from medial to lateral. So you'll always see them arranged from anterior to posterior, from superior to inferior, from medial to lateral, depending on where on this diagram we happen to be uh, talking about. So to look at some of our functions, cranial nerve one, the olfactory nerve, sense of smell. You will see those fine nerve endings dangle through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone out into the nasal mucosa. So our olfactory bulb sits right on top of that ethmoid bone. Sense of smell. Cranial nerve two, the optic nerve. Vision. We will see, if we draw where the eyes would be roughly, we will see optic nerves extend back from each eye. They will cross over. It's the only cranial nerve where we get to see the contralateral crossing over. This X projection here we're going to call the optic chiasm. And then posteriorly, we will see the optic chiasm lead back to the occipital lobe through the optic tracts. So optic nerve leading through the optic chiasm and then back to the occipital lobe with the optic tract vision. Next up, functionally, I want you to lump together cranial nerve 3, cranial nerve 4. I'm going to skip one for a moment. Jump to cranial nerve 6. 3, 4, and 6. Collectively, they innervate what we call the extraocular muscles, the muscles that move the eyeball around inside the orbit. Additionally, we will also see cranial nerve 3 control pupillary constriction and accommodation. 
Accommodation is where the eyes converge like a cross-eyed pattern, and then they constrict at the same time. Cranial nerve 5, the trigeminal nerve, the largest diameter cranial nerve. It's called the trigeminal because of its three branches. You have a frontal branch that innervates sensation of the face, of the forehead, above the eye. You have a maxillary branch that supplies sensation over the cheek. And then you have a mandibular branch that supplies sensation for the lower jaw. So sensory for the entire face over those three branches. We also see a motor function where it's going to innervate what we call the muscles of mastication, the muscles involved with chewing. Next up, remember we skip six, move on to seven. Facial nerve. Innervates the muscles of facial expression. Smiling, raising the eyebrows. Puckering the lips. All muscles innervated by branches of the facial nerve. Now we also see the facial nerve involved with taste. The anterior two-thirds of the tongue is innervated by the facial nerve. And we also see the facial nerve innervate some of our glandular tissues. The submandibular salt glands in particular. Next up is our vestibulocochlear, cranial nerve 8. Really two nerves in one. A vestibular nerve goes from the middle ear, or inner ear, sorry, from the inner ear for balance and coordination. You hear people have inner ear infections and they get dizzy. That's because it's affecting the cochlea or the, the vestibular apparatus for balance and coordination. And it has a cochlear branch. That's for hearing. We have our spiral organ called the cochlea. Modified mechanoreceptors that will take sound waves, convert it into a vibration through a fluid that's then picked up by these mechanoreceptors. So two somewhat unrelated functions they just happen to run in the same nerve sheath. Next up, cranial nerve 9, glossopharyngeal. Taste for the posterior third of the tongue. So for taste, we have cranial nerve 7 for the anterior, cranial nerve 9 for the posterior. Cranial nerve 10 is the vagus nerve, vagus to vagabond, the wandering nerve. This is the longest cranial nerve innervates many of our visceral organs. In AMP2, you'll talk about a lot of visceral feedback mechanisms. Things like heart rate changes is going to be done through the vagus nerve. Cranial nerve 11, the accessory nerve, sometimes called the spinal accessory nerve. This has the oddest pathway. All of these are called cranial nerves because they originate off of either the brainstem or the brain. And then they exit the skull through various openings. In this case, the accessory nerve actually comes off the upper spinal cord. But rather than leave through the cervical spine like the other cervical nerves, it climbs the spinal cord on the outside, goes through the frame and magnum in the skull, and then exits the skull again to innervate some of the muscles that move the neck, the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius muscles. And last up, cranial nerve 12, the hypoglossal nerve, innervates the muscles that move the tongue. So there we go. An awful lot of memorization in this particular section. You should be making a list of 
brain parts. On one side of your cue card, you have the, the area in question. On the other side, you have the function. If it's a very specific part, maybe what general part it resides in. Like the inferior olivary nucleus is part of the medulla. You should have all these cranial nerves written on one side of a card and its function on the other. The only conceptual thing we had here now was understanding how sensory and motor function integrate together to give us nice, smooth, coordinated activity. But if you've been waiting for a memorization section to come around, this is the moment you've been waiting for. So as usual, if you have any questions, please reach out and let me know. We'll tackle each question as they come. And I will see you next time.